Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Prep, Plan, Protect, an E911 Compliance Roadmap. I'm Ann Cosgrove, the Editorial Director at Facility Executive, and this webinar today is presented by Everbridge. Before we get started, I'd like to cover just a few housekeeping items. Please note the control panel on your screen. This is where you could submit questions for our speaker in the question box in that panel. You can send your questions in at any time and they will be addressed uh, after the talk. Uh, if we do not get to your question, please note that the speaker will uh, address it directly, so you certainly will get an answer. Uh, also, please note the orange arrow on the left side of your control panel. Clicking on that will either expand or collapse the panel, so please be sure it is expanded. Uh, if you have a technical difficulty at any time, you can send in a message in that question section and we'll answer you privately. Lastly, if you're interested in continuing education credits, please note you'll receive a certificate of attendance in an email from Facility Executive after this event, and you can report that to your association. Now, well, moving forward, I'd like to introduce your speaker, Matt Schmidt. Matt is Senior Product Marketing Manager at Everbridge, which acquired Red Sky Technologies in 2021. Red Sky is the leader in E911 solutions in North America, and Matt's career spans several industries, including software as a service solutions, joining Red Sky in early 2020. With FCC regulations for universal E911 compliance in place in North America, Matt's role has included education, educating business leaders on protecting employees while proactively shielding business from non-compliance risk. So we're looking forward to this talk today, and again, look forward to your questions. Uh, hi, Matt. Hi, Ann. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, hello, everyone. Um, thanks for joining the webinar today. Uh, as Ann said, I'm Matt Schmidt, Senior Product Marketing Manager at, uh, at Everbridge. And you might already know that uh, federal E911 regulation compliance dates have recently been passed. Uh, we will discuss the significance of those dates for sure, but let's also talk about the detail of those regulations and most importantly, what is it exactly that, that your organization needs to be compliant with these laws? You know, after all, uh, compliance is gonna mean protecting your people while keeping your business and your facilities operational with reduced risk exposure. Okay, so today's organizations are being asked to do more with less, and part of that is keeping your employees safe, whether they're on-premise or if they work at home. It's absolutely the new normal. That's not hyperbole. And we're all juggling these priorities. This list here is familiar to you folks in the facilities management field, but what actually are the priorities and how do we balance them? These will be some of the things I'll ask you to consider while we talk today. We'll get back to this in, in just a minute. So a quick important note, we are providing information about compliance, compliance to federal regulations. So we do feel obligated to offer our disclaimer that we are not lawyers. And so please do consult your legal counsel before taking any action or refraining from action, frankly, or with all this information that we're presenting today. So just a super quick look at Everbridge and Red Sky. As Ann said, Red Sky joined the, the global Everbridge family in January of 2021, about a year ago. Uh, Red Sky is based in Chicago and has served the U.S. and Canada going back 20 years as the longest stretch of any e one business. Everbridge is the global leader in critical event management and enterprise resilient software applications that automate and accelerate an organization's ability to respond to these critical events in order to keep people safe and businesses running. Just a note before we get into all the compliance talk, as you take note of all the dimension of being compliant, uh, know that Red Sky Solutions offer 100% of E911 compliance. So today we'll start off with an overview of Kerry's Law and Ray Baum's Act, uh, which are peculiar to these regulations that I've been mentioning uh, and E911. Uh, protecting workers, the steps needed for compliance, important dates and deadlines, and spoiler alerts, we're, we're past them all. Uh, and 
we have some parting gifts, some nice resources for you. And then finally, we'll do some Q&A. So why is it the time to act now? It kind of comes down to one concept. Last year, the FCC published a new set of rules around 911 for multiple line telephone systems. And okay, even though some of you might know what a multiple line telephone system is in relation to your facilities, and if you don't, no problem. In the next slide, I'll take you into a few terms, but for now, let's just presume most organizations have these multi-line telephone systems, which is absolutely the case. So getting back to these FCC rules, in those rules, the FCC placed several effective dates. In fact, between Kerry's Law and Ray Baum's Act, more about these in a second, uh, there were three important dates to recognize. And at Everbridge and Red Sky, we've been talking about these dates for a long time. And for you, we've just this month crossed the last date on none other than January 6th, uh, 2022. And we know we can't just throw a switch and expect everything to work. It takes planning. And in terms of planning, we also know that in order to do anything, it takes money and budget and a budget cycle. So we want to help you at least understand what you're going to need to do so that you can prepare and be ready to go. Okay, so some key terms we need to be aware of. PSAP is Public Safety Answering Point. That's the physical building where 911 calls are answered. In the United States, there's about 6,000 of them, some very small, some that employ over a thousand people and take millions of calls in these emergency call centers each year. Hard phones, <clears throat> excuse me, or a static device. This is really key because the FCC rules focus in on this concept. It's most often a phone like you see in the lower right hand corner, but can include other stationary devices that are enabled to make calls. And soft phones. These are typically found on laptops that enable them to make what we all feel are normal dial tone type calls. And if these devices, whether on a laptop or a tablet or even a smartphone, because they do run on smartphones, if they're drawing what we'll call enterprise dial tone, then they fall into these regulations. And what that means basically then is if, if these devices are, are provisioned by your organization and are using these multi-line telephone systems and using the, that dial tone, then they fall into it. So looks like the end, but wait, what about that phone system? Um, you know, the, the MLTS, pretty much every organization that has, you know, more than 20 or so people in it likely has an MLTS for phones. And anything larger than that, getting into the largest businesses, of course, they do too. And one more, the E and E911, just so you know, stands for Enhanced 911. Basically, this type of 911 call comes with lots more information than just the street address that you would normally see, you know, for a, a residential call. So on August 1st, 2019, the FCC adopted what's called a report and order requiring E911 for enterprise spaces. The, the FCC adopted the rules to set minimum E911 legislation across the US. And yes, there already were laws in place, but at the state level only. And they were all over the place and not every state had them. All enterprise uh, companies and organizations using MLTS systems are subject to this FCC report and order. So by definition, this includes nearly every organization in business in the United States. So Carrie's law came out of a tragic event. A Texas woman named Carrie Hunt was assaulted in a hotel room. At that time, her nine-year-old child tried to call 911, but this child did not know she needed to dial 
nine to get an outside line. So most unfortunately, Kerry Hunt died that day and the hotel eventually had to pay a $41 million legal claim to the family of Kerry Hunt. So part one of Kerry's law says, you cannot require anybody to dial a prefix like nine or eight or anything to get an outside line before reaching 911. Just dial 911 has to complete that emergency call and connect to that PSAP we we're talking about. There's a simple yardstick for determining whether your phones apply. If you can dial for pizza from your phone, then you must be able to dial 911 as well. This is the sort of analogy we like to use um, at Everbridge. Now, I'm not going to get into the letter of these laws. There's lots of detail there. Uh, lots of it is repetitious. Remember my legal disclaimer in the beginning. However, for all dimensions of these regulations, from your business and facilities point of view, it's important to understand the scope of the impact with respect to all the players involved. And again, we won't get into the detail, but that detail does mention who is on the hook in the spectrum of stakeholders. And these include manufacturers of telecommunication systems and software and distributors and resellers of these, uh, installers, and even those who manage and operate the systems on behalf of these companies. Sometimes that's the case. This is not a trivial aspect of all this either, uh, but if you believe your business falls into one of these buckets, you for sure want to make sure that not only is your business compliant, and that your facilities are as safe as possible, but that your business is also making other businesses compliant as well. In part two of Kerry's Law, think back to that hotel I was telling you about. It was felt that had the hotel been notified that somebody in a room had dialed 911, that that person would have been able to not only assist, but to also help the first responders find the caller, thus the emergency notifications component of this regulation. This is where the facility team comes in handy. The people to be notified in this case can include a security desk attendant, a receptionist, or anyone across the organization who is felt could be useful to an emergency caller, or who might be best situated to assess, for, assess first responders in gaining access to the part of the facility where the caller is calling from. And you see dispatchable location there. More about that in a second. Okay, that was a lot of info. So the takeaways here are twofold. You can see how all this protects your people and the risk of liability is clear and it's significant. As you can see, Kerry's law was the first E911 compliance law to take effect and is thus the most widely known and referenced component of the FCC regulation. So, Sorry for the, the boredom here, but let's just quickly read the front end of this paragraph because it's relevant. Kerry's law expressly provides that Congress did not intend to alter the authority of state commissions or other state or local agencies, blah, blah, blah. Okay, you can kind of continue on yourself. This means that, hey, if, if the state has a tougher or more rigorous law, you need to weigh that first, or at least alongside. It's likely going to be the law that you're going to pay attention to, but at the end of the day, it's the one that's most rigid that needs to be paid attention to. It's the one that matters. Okay, next up is section 506, a small but very important portion in terms of E911 of the Ray Bombs Act the law says that for every 911 call, there has to be what's known as a dispatchable location that is sent with that call, information wise, to the dispatch center. And dispatchable location is the street address and other information such as floor or a zone or room number 
it's important to note that the FCC went out of its way not to quantify dispatchable location as it's intent based and it has a lot of variability based on the different facilities that we're talking about eventually. So for example, they didn't say you need a dispatchable location for every 10,000 square feet and more on that in just a bit. Also, <clears throat> excuse me, I'll, I'll speak more about the different devices that fall into these regulations as well as the compliance dates associated with them. Again, we've all passed them. Um, and in summary, the definition of dispatchable location that we adopt today gives participants in the MLTS marketplace flexibility in deciding what level of detail should be included in the location information provided to PSAPs for the particular environments that we're talking about, so long as the level of detail is what is known as functionally sufficient to enable first responders to identify the location of a 911 caller in that environment. So <clears throat> those devices I was talking about, this matrix is pretty simple and straightforward. Uh, the dates are important, uh, even though we're now past them all. They all relate to Ray Bombs Act compliance. Across the top, you have hard phones, the ones you have on your desk, just to repeat, and soft phones. Along the side, you have on and off premise detail. In the middle, you have the dates for those. Now, let's take the time to repeat this. All dates have now passed. So if you knew about Ray Bombs Act uh, you know, a year ago, you'd think you'd had some time until the next one hit. Well, we're all in the same boat now, and this law does not discriminate. All organizations in the US that operate in MLTS, and that's pretty much every one of us, we're all in on these deadlines. They're all in the past. So let's take our foot off the gas here for a second and reflect just why these laws came to be. It's again, pretty simple. Connect first responders with the information they need to successfully assist in an emergency. Get to the 911 caller as swiftly as possible. And finally, to be technologically agnostic. These 911 callers need to get emergency services and technology just cannot get in the way here. So I think it should be clear who the beneficiaries are of this legislation. First and foremost, it's the 911 caller in the midst of an emergency, right? finding a person on the east side of the 16th floor of a building that's locked down is a challenge just by itself not to mention if the first responders do not have the location information they need of course the companies themselves stand to gain from this legislation and acting on it and getting compliant with it protecting employees is job one but let's be clear about the risks to a business for not being compliant they are significant and they're costly. So I'll spare you from reading this, but this comes up. Are you associated with a small business? Are you a, a nonprofit? Even? Your organization is not exempt. The objective threshold has to do with the fact that there's an MLTS in place and that can be problematic the law is in place to eliminate the barriers to a safe outcome when 911 call is placed this is across the board okay let's sum up for a second before we get uh, into the next segment the triggers to meet the requirements include the deadline dates themselves and when major updating of an existing system takes place. We have the direct dialing and notifications components of Kerry's Law. The teeth come from the Enforcement Bureau of the FCC. And I was talking about the manufacturer and supplier before. The end users also must comply in a share 
of this liability. And you know, end users meaning the end user organization and company. There's so much detail to get into around dispatchable location. And like I said, we'll talk more about that and we'll have a resource for you to investigate this further. So we now understand the why for all this. Now let's pivot to action. What does it take to prepare? What does it take to, to plan, which you know is different? And then what does it take to protect your employees and their guests and visitors to your, your business, excuse me? So how do you prepare? Really preparing means understanding this concept of dispatchable location. This understanding includes where your so-called endpoints are, whether this is a device in the building, and if we're talking about a remote worker making a call from a laptop, we're talking about that as well. And then understanding what kind of technologies may come with your phone system and what you may need to do to supplement these systems. Okay, hold up. I wanna reassure you that this discussion is not about telecoms technology. I'm not gonna drag you through manifestations of voice over IP versus analog and PBX versus SIP trunking and all that business. However, this is absolutely about compliance and risk management and protecting your people and facilities. And to actually do these things, we'll need to partner with our friends in IT and telecoms. And I think, you know, most of you probably already have that established, um, those relationships established, but uh, they will absolutely be a partner in this project. So, in prep, back to Kerry's Law, and here's where compliance meets that collaboration I was talking about. And like I was saying, if getting started on this journey for your organization will fall into your lap, your first move may be to connect with that technology partner to ensure they have a good understanding of your call servers, which is essentially your phone system. Then you need to understand who are the people that should be notified. Like I said, the team and facilities should have a good understanding of that, but who is that team that should be notified if ever a 911 call is placed? For example, a college campus may have a, a safety department that has a dedicated person to notify. Uh, a sprawling automobile dealership may not have such a person. Um, is there a reception desk, a security team? Uh, does the facilities team manage this? So these are the, some of the questions uh, you wanna ask. Who is that person or a team in your organization? All right, Ray Bombs Act. Remember, this is really centered on that, wait for it, you know, the concept of dispatchable locations. So whether, you know, we're using a map or just a straight up table or a handwritten list or, you know, spreadsheet, it will be important to make sure that every building and facility in your enterprise has a legitimate street address speaking to the converted. Again, this will take close coordination with teams across your organization that may go beyond the facilities team here. So just a quick side note, uh, since you were good enough to sit in on the session today, you will receive the fast track to E911 compliance handbook from Everbridge. And in this handbook, you'll find details of all the teams who will need to be involved and what they need to do. Okay, there's lots of E911 solutions out there. Some are built into the call servers I mentioned. Discover what your provider is providing natively. So, uh, and then determine if that meets your needs. As a rule of thumb, an organization with over 200 hard phones will likely need what we'll call a programmatic approach. And essentially what that means is 
you're going to need some budget for some technology and a technology partner. And you're likely using soft phone clients now on your laptops. Well, that just kind of breaks 911 right there. I mean, just going beyond the desk phones. Because we can take these laptops anywhere, right? So do your research on what's, ne what's needed. All right, moving on to plan. Uh, you kind of know what you have to do, right? So now, how do you do it? There's really a couple of things you want to balance. Your work plan, budget cycles, contract stuff, mapping buildings and devices, deployment, lots of stuff. Remember the teamwork and collaboration bits I mentioned? It, it really takes a team to pull this off. Carrie's Law, back to Carrie's Law. So the due date has passed, right? Long ago. The asterisk is there due to some exceptions around updates versus new equipment. But given the last 12 to 18 months, 24 months, you got to think lots and lots of updates have very likely occurred. And updates, you know, on top of those updates, and it all got fast forwarded about 10 years, I think. And if any system upgrades are planned, you need to make sure that you're planning to become compliant as part of that. And then dispatchable location, I'm, I'm just going to tell you, and this is why we have the disclaimer that we're not lawyers or your counsel. It's a pretty soft topic. The FCC in most states Again, do not define what dispatchable location means. So let's look at some pictures of an example facility for help. So in the picture up here in the upper right-hand corner, you've got this 50,000 square foot loading dock. It's got a nice open line of sight. You can see all of the phones on the walls. If a first responder comes into one of these doors you see there, they're very likely gonna need or, or see who needs help. If I go down to the warehouse, I've got all these racks of equipment and I, I can't see across the room. I'm gonna to need to create multiple zones to help guide the first responder to find out where that call is coming from. And closed door offices, to me, this is a no brainer. Everyone that needs a closed door office needs their own dispatchable location. In this picture, how do you know which office the caller is, is even in uh, without having it in the programmed dispatchable location? And then finally, you've got this open cube farm. Since it's likely only two doors are, are coming in, the location of who needs to help should be pretty evident. You could get by with just a single dispatchable location. Now, if there's 500 people in there, you wanna be smart about it and break it into zones. But in this picture, one should be sufficient. So the last part of the plan is to find your e in one solution. We know the dates are upon us. The, the project is definitely complex. Everbridge and Red Sky will get you to 100% compliance. Okay, so moving on to protect our final piece. Why are we doing all this? It's not just because it's the right thing to do. You want to make sure that you're protecting the most important aspects of your operating environment, and that's employee and guest safety. Anybody could pick up a phone and dial 911. Be sure your people and your business are protected. So the responsibility of the employer is now documented with these laws which means 
while before these regulations were in place, somebody could decide that, you know, nobody ever calls 911 anyway. So when something bad happens now, somebody can just point to this and say, hey, you weren't compliant. This is where you can now plainly see that the corporate risk portfolio just grew significantly. And you know the common vision of the world is that people are going to be working remotely indefinitely. Now there's some news that came out even just last week that kind of seems to fly in the face of that, but certainly lots of remote workers. You need to make sure that your employees who are using corporate assets, even at home or on the road or even on vacation, admit it, we all do it. We need to make sure all of them are protected when the emergency inevitably occurs. And this last one, and you know, I kind of struggled with the kind of the wording of this. Um, the idea of deploying a 911 solution is not only to protect your employees, but it's also to mitigate the risk associated with when something bad happens. So it's there to protect the employer as well. And this is just the quick commercial part of it. For Red Sky Solutions, just remember this, these three words, find, route, and notify. Everbridge provides you the tools so that you're compliant. We've got the solutions to find employees making 911 calls no matter where they are. And Everbridge provides the routing to all these piece apps we talked about. And there's lots of notification types supporting remote workers in across the campus. And the Everbridge footprint covers the US and Canada today with likely more markets to follow. The key is the tools are there to be compliant today. Please help yourself to these free resources. I believe they will also be provided to uh, each participant to this webinar. The Fast Track to E911 Compliance Handbook and the E911 Made Easy Project Checklist. Um, if you like, use the easy links below. Uh, and in the Fast Track Handbook, you'll find part one, understanding 911 regulations. It's a review uh, and even more detail and all the stuff we just went over regarding the FCC, uh, Kerry's Law, direct dialing and notifications, the Ray Bombs Act, dispatchable location, of course. Um, and in the second part, three steps towards compliance. Uh, the first step is to define your enterprise. Step two is identify those stakeholders we're talking about. And step three is some info on budget and procurement resources. So thank you, and uh, I will turn it back over to Anne. I believe we'll have um, some Q&A. Yes, yes, thank you, Matt. Thanks so much um, for that important discussion. There's a lot of good information in there along with those resources. Uh, yes, we do have a number of questions, so we will jump right in. And um, let's see. I do want to ask you, just to kind of reset the stage here and provide context, since you did cover a lot, um, can you just talk about once more a review? What what is the difference between 911 and E 911? Sure, 911 um, has been around for for 50 years or or more. Um, it's uh, of course started um, with uh, you know residential information um, and is in its most basic sense uh, just the the address location information um, that's programmed into. Uh, you know, the information that these PSAPs have and into the, uh, the telephone systems. Uh, e911 is, is enhanced 911 that has the capacity to carry lots more information. Um, so so uh, first responders can get to those folks who are in distress um, as accurately and efficiently as possible. Okay, thank you. Now I'll, I'll jump into a, a several questions we have about devices, uh, where you're calling from, uh, what you're calling from, and I um, I know you did cover that, but we we want to definitely be sure to answer some folks' specific questions here. So um, my question that I have here is, uh, what happens when I call nine one one using my mobile phone? Yeah, sure. Um, 
So mobile phones, uh, smartphones, all of them, the service providers that, that provide them to you or at least provide the service, they do operate separately from what we have discussed on this call. Um, calls made using dial tone from these wireless providers are tracked using different technology, like I was saying before. Uh, some of the soft phone clients do operate on smartphones and thus can be impacted by these laws. So if you use a soft phone on your laptop and you've got an equivalent for that soft phone on your smartphone, just because you want to use or are required to use um, the enterprise system, then that's how your, your cell phone or your smartphone can be affected. Okay, thank you. So let's get back into the compliance angle and with devices in mind, we have some questions here on that. Uh, and the, the question is, uh, how would uh, compliance be ensured with non-issued, quote unquote, personal cell phones? So can you talk to that, uh, speak to that? Sure, it, it, it kind of goes along part and parcel with what I was um, saying a moment ago, uh, but your your personal cell phone or even your, your um, company provisioned cell phone um, mm -hmm. You know, those are effectively the same when we're talking about using the service providers dial tone um, and and service right for uh, for anything that you're doing on either of those devices. It's when you start to tap into the enterprise dial tone and that enterprise is using an MLTS or this multi-line telephone system and you're using say a soft phone that you know again taps directly into that system that is where these laws start to become important okay and we did receive a question in specifically uh, about e91 911 compliance for soft phone apps and I, I you have covered it extensively here so um, is there anything else that we should address there or um, no I, I don't think so um, there are lots okay. of different flavors of these these soft phones um, and I, I think I, it almost comes down to like a personal preference of, of whether you used to like like to use uh, soft phones on your own cell phone but certainly when you're using you know soft phone uh, I, I use it all the time on my on my laptop because it, it does have dial tone it works just like a regular phone it allows me to just use my headset and not my kind of awkward cell phone okay it, those soft phones you know when you're using that with your enterprise dial tone that, those are where they fall into the compliance um, uh, framework okay great and I have a, a question that's a little a bit different now and uh, one that I had not been aware of that I've never seen <clears throat> personally. Uh, and the question is, uh, my company gave me a sticker that says, don't dial 911 from this device. Uh, and the questioner is, is asking, is this compliant with FCC legislation? Um, no, it's it's not. Um, uh, definitely, you know, consult, you know, corporate uh, attorneys on this one too. Um, but those could be legacy stickers too. Most often we're finding that from from state laws. So state laws did have some loopholes that sometimes these uh, these labels were used to to, to get through those laws. Um, those vary from state to state. So, uh, but on the main, they're they're you know when those stickers are are not going to um, to get you uh, through any of this that we just discussed. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, and so. Uh, can you opt out of E911? I know we're talking about compliance here, and you mentioned it's across the United States, and, and kind of with the the state regulations being um, more, um, I guess what you should look at first is what I gathered. Please correct me if I'm wrong. But the question is specifically, can I opt out of E911? Right, and and you know th these this discussion was very heavy on the laws uh, specific to the U.S. Um, most recently. Uh, Canada does have their uh, their own laws um, but within the US uh, you certainly cannot opt out um, but again uh, that is going to be you know, evaluating what your organization type is um, do you have uh, uh, an MLTS that um, might be grandfathered because you've not upgraded it recently in any way shape or form again those are discussions you want to have um, make sure that your uh, corporate counsel is is tuned into. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, and then we'll we'll get to the the meat of the matter here. Uh, and the question is, uh, how does implementing an E nine one one solution make me compliant with Ray Bonds Act and Carrie's law? Yeah, this this uh, um, speaks to what you might already have in place. Um, but when implementing an E nine one one solution, there are those three features uh, that we went over. It must have those things that we talked about, uh, it must provide the on-site notification alert that's triggered when someone calls 911. Uh, when that call is made from an on-campus phone or in that MLTS, uh, that the call is answered by the PSAP, that location information is automatically presented to that 911 operator and must include accurate information is the second part. Um, and then lastly, when that call is made from a device not located within that corporate campus, that that current correct address must also be presented to that PSAP. And this includes you know, situations when people are working remotely or from wherever they might be working. And can you, we did get a question on that with remote workers, um, as, as you know, and as many in the listening, um, I'm certainly are dealing with remote workers, I would imagine. Um, the question is, do I need to cover remote workers? I know you, you've, you've touched on that, of course, and talked about it, but can you just talk a little bit about more about remote workers, if that's a specific, um, you know, kind of question that this questioner has as well, sure. I'm sure others who are listening. Yeah, and, and the relevance of that question was cemented uh, this past January 6th, when the last part of Ray Bombs um, became effective. So therefore, again, just to kind of repeat all, all aspects of that FCC report and order, all dates have now mm -hmm. passed. But that last one um, with remote workers and being, rem uh, you know, using soft phones and, and so on, using remote devices, uh, it, it, the FCC really intended to not slam everyone with these laws and kind of stepped and tiered them out. That last tier was uh, for remote workers um, earlier this month. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. Uh, and, you know, kind of talking about the, you know, you mentioned uh, the, the dates have passed, you know, compliance is, should be certainly, um, you know, in motion, uh, or on, that's my statement, but what happens, uh, the question is what happens if we conducted system upgrades after February 16, 2020, but did not do full replacements? What, are, what yep. situation is this person in? Sure, that's a common question, like what is an upgrade? Um, mm -hmm. And that, that upgrade could be a full kind of change out. Um, it could just be like a, a feature upgrade. And so there's a lot of room in there. So this again is the rule of thumb is if you did a significant upgrade to uh, after February 16th, then you're you're going to need to comply with Kerry's law and Rape Bombs Act. Um, okay. And but again, uh, back back to the old uh, uh, consult your your corporate attorney. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, and we have um, another question here. We are running up a little bit against the clock. I want to let anyone know that if we did not get to your question, uh, Matt will be able to address that directly with you, so it won't be lost. Um, and Matt, I, well, I'll just close out with this question. Um, it's a little bit off the, the path here, but the question is, what is NG911 and is it required? Can you talk on that? Yeah, um, that stands for the NG is next generation. Uh, okay. So it's next generation now in one. And as, as technology has advanced, um, these PSAP operators have now requested, and, and again, you think of these larger PSAPs, uh, and the ones that are perhaps more funded and can do things like, what about a floor map or even links to, to cameras that are on site? At the end of the day, this is all data that can be transmitted. And so, but that's also data that can be um, useful to both the PSAP operator and communicating with the first responders, the first responders themselves. It can be useful to people who are within um, the business itself. So, but that transmission of that, what I'll call rich data is the heart and soul of next generation 911. There are um, regulations and, 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 and laws coming up to speed on, uh, on NG911, they're certainly not in place yet, but they, um, you know, they'll be here before before we know it. 
Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Um, I want to thank you, Matt, for your talk today and for, for this great information. Thanks a lot. Yep. Thank you, Anne. And thank you to Everbridge for sponsoring the webinar and, of course, our audience for listening in today and for your questions. Uh, I do want to let you know a recording from today's session will be made available on our magazine's website. That's facilityexecutive.com. And also, please visit Ever, the Everbridge website, which is everbridge.com. Uh, lastly, I do want, want to remind everyone listening that the resources Matt showed um, in the previous slide will be available to anyone who um, was and took part in the webinar. So thank you so much. And uh, thanks again, Matt. Have a great afternoon.